Thank you very much. The title of my paper is uh, Analysis of Feminine Gender as Perceived in the Nigerian Hip Hop Culture. For some time now, I've been undertaking uh, some research into the Nigerian hip hop culture, uh, both in uh, musicological, sociological uh, uh, aspect. And uh, part of what I've been working on is the aspect of the feminine gender in uh, hip hop. The last two decades have witnessed tremendous growth in the hip hop music culture in Nigeria because of its enormous appeal it has been used as a medium for expressing varieties of ideas, feelings, and emotions. However, we have a growing concern on the negative impact of the music on the perception of women in the society. In spite of the seeming financial success and popularity of these musicians, we find out that the uh, hip hop culture is frequently condemned for its misogynistic exploitation of women. This paper examines, therefore, the ideologies expressed in Nigeria's hip hop music with specific uh, uh, mention of the female gender and its implication to the larger society. It will also examine the effects of hip hop lyrics on the videos on, um, and videos on the youths due to their focus on and the promotion of sex, drugs, crime, and misogyny. I, I, I start with the conceptualization of the present-day hip-hop, which we do know originated in New York during the early 1970s as a form of African-American street culture. Aware of the inner city tension that were created as a consequence of urban renewal programs and economic reception, recession, a street gang member who called himself Africa Bamba Bata formed the Zulu Nation in an attempt to channel the anger of the youth people in South Bronx away from fighting into music, dance, and uh, graffiti. And coming back to Nigeria, we can situate the origin of hip hop to the late 1980s and the early 90s, where we had the emergence of a hip hop musician by name Salim Omari, an African-American rapper who came in exile into Nigeria and, led, and his coming in led to the release of the Nigerian ap, uh, rap album titled I Am African. These opened the floodgates for other artists like the Remedies Plantation Boys in the early 90s. The first generation of hip-hop artists at first imitated their counterparts in the United States. However, the trend in the late 19th still they show the transformation with the evolution of what we call now the Niger hip hop. So uh, we now want to consider, because of time, the hip hop and the gender. Feminism and gender studies have been a focus of scholarly inquiries since the second half of the 20th century. While some see men and women as often Hostile groups locked in an unending and unequal struggle for power. Others view them, view them as complementary. The hip hop world tilts somehow towards this second assumption. However, it seems that men are the beneficiaries of this complementary arrangement, where the women are portrayed as objects of desires. Even though the Niger uh, in Nigeria has a few hip hop female artists in the industry, Majority of these artists are male, and the backup singers, uh, the majority of these artists are male that have backup singers uh, who are female. Then, this has resulted in the misuse of gender role of women in music as sex object, sex symbol. The term sex symbol, which was first used in 1910 to describe beautiful stars in the film industry, but since then, industries have played a role in the further projection of sex symbolism through its dissemination of beautiful people all over the world. However, sex symbolism is taking an alarming dimension in the music industry where women are commodified. Writing on the negative effects of the hip hop on the American youth, Ayana observed that all women, most blackly women in particular, are seen in popular hip hop culture as sex objects. 
She stressed further that almost every hip hop video that is regularly run today shows many dancing women wearing much more than the, the bikinis with cameras focusing on their body parts. These images are shown to go along with a lot of explicit lyrics that normalize the degradation of women. As a male dominated culture, hip hop has forced women to become victims of misogynic violence as expressed by Morgan. An American woman's identification with her gender has always been a product of her race and the social construction that surround the ident identity, as said by Ayana. And so we now want to ask, how has this actually played out in Nigeria? How have the hip hop musician uh, applied the use of women in trying to gain acceptance, trying to promote their, their music, and in trying to make people you know, tilt towards the, the lyrics. So we find out that more often than not, the marketers and promoters are those that really call the shots. In Nigeria, we have promoters like Kenny's Music, Mohit, now called, uh, 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 forgotten the name now, and then Storm Records. All these uh, com contribute greatly to the promotion of mus music in Nigeria. And we find out that also in Nigeria, much airtime is devoted to playing hip hop music with Nigerian content. And then we now have a lot of uh, uh, satellite music stations like Hip Hop World, Music Africa, Music on Wheels, Bedou, Nigeria, Sound City, and other cable stations devoted to the promotion of hip hop music in Nigeria. Well, the aim of these establishments is purely commercial, and their overriding interest in is the sale of their music, and they enjoy all the means, they employ all means to achieve these goals. As Mark Anthony suggests that these uh, music promoters are those that actually sow the field of uh, misogyny for the patriarchal and provide the labor necessary to keep them in operation. And we now have what we call the victims, which uh, in a way have, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, a, a work that a lot of people engage in. In Nigeria now, lots of women youth engaging, it has found its way into the country. And the reason for such media hype by the music product producers is seen in the slogan that uh, sex sells. Mark Anthony, I mean, uh, Mark Anthony Neal is right to point out that the industry thrives on sexism and that asking artists to promote a feminist vision would be asking them to drop their contract and sell far fewer records. In a study done about black to female relationship of the hip hop generation, many black men in the hip hop culture that were interviewed valued economic resources and used these resources as a way to manipulate and control women. Reacting to the promoter's craving for financial aggrandizement in Nigerian hip hop scene, a popular music star in Nigeria observed that what the promoters want is instant financial gratification. The culture, of Chinese, the musicians have nurtured over time is taken over by self-centeredness and greed. They feel the pulse of the youth outside and dance to their tunes. The song, as in vogue in America, is based on uh, violence, money, that is hip hop, strippers and sex. Unfortunately, it has now come to us in Nigeria and we are sinking it down, both hook, line, and sinker. That's Waje King. Uh, saying this, generally a good music video must have good music coupled with artistic presentation in both performance and delivery. But the question we need to ask is, must it be at the, the, the expense of our values in the society, our cultural values in Nigeria? The most disturbing aspect of this actually is that most, much of the sexual uh, Exploitation is done with the concept and collaboration of the women in, 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 in the video. In Nigeria, most of the women that show up for the music videos shoot are young undergraduates who are paid stipends by these promoters 
just to post nude with the superstar. The bottom line is that the women are used to what with the sexual appetite of the viewers in order to sell their product. Another hip hop musician also stressed in an interview that the success of the music is all about the money, the power, and the sex. The priorities have been misplaced in our plea bid to please the wrong people, but it is wrong. What is obvious might not be real because what you see us do in the videos is cosmic. It's purely a commercial thing. The act is degrading. Women are subject, uh, who subject themselves to such are only interested in the money. Their portrayal of women as indeed, they portray the women as indecent, modest, immodest, and lacking in value, which is appalling. And the Omojula claimed that the main goal of our culture is the inculcation of natural, national consciousness, advancement of the appreciation of arts and culture, and the achieve, enrichment of Nigeria's anti, uh, identity nationwide, but only very few musical videos are, have achieved the same. I believe that what we see is an imitation of what is done in the West, and while I will agree that music should provide avenues of free interaction and mingling across regional boundary, it is dangerous for us to allow the values of other uh, crimes to be the yardstick for measuring our success. When we look at the Niger hip hop lyrics, we see them divided uh, into six themes. Uh, a good number of the lyrics that I have uh, uh, been privy to, uh, with specific reference to gender, women. Uh, the first one is derogatory statements about women in sexual manners. The second is statements involving violence especially sexual violence against women. The third one is references to women causing trouble for men. The fourth is the characterization of women as users of men. The fifth is the reference of women being inferior to men. And then the sixth one is references to women as usable and discardable objects. When we turn to the analysis of the lyrics, we find two that are more, because of the time, and because of the fact that I do not want to be booted out, I will just give one. Mm. Uh, especially uh, with specific reference to one hip hop artist, Two Faced Sidibia, who says, Enter the place. The excerpt below speaks about women that are objects to be used and abused. And I take a reference from one of the lyrics. Interestingly, this has been banned by the National Broadcasting Corporation from being aired on the airwaves because of the sexual, uh, the sexual context. It says, when you're feeling down, we try to turn the tables all around. I see you, I burden you, girl, I want to make you, let me enter the place. Make we see if you know carry belay too. My phone must be ringing cause your body's calling. No need to de knock the door, just enter. Get it straight and jump to the floor and make me see if you know Kari Beletu. Now, Kari Beletu is make, let me see if I do not get you pregnant after I have entered the place. What place? Of course, your guess, is, your guess is as good as mine. So we see them painting such pictures, not just him, but several other people. And uh, as I close, I feel the, gross, the growing concern of a lot of us who are in the industry should really be how we can maintain sanctity in the music industry to ensure that our youths do not inculcate the wrong values in the society. And that is the more reason why it is necessary that we get it across because it, we, we see that they are feeding the youths with exactly what they want and not what they need. And then as much as possible, we try to preserve our cultural values in such a very decent manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know that we've heard a very provocative paper, and I'm sure there are many questions. But let's hold our questions till we've heard from all of our speakers. And we should have then excellent discussion at the end. So, 
Again, would you reintroduce yourself and you are who? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Kola Oleo Sini. Work with Lagos State Government, Minister of Home Affairs and Culture. I've tried to do a summary of what will be done here so that uh, I don't exceed the time. I will try to reach through. So maybe when questions come, we can now discuss. I want to, be, to speak on historical sites as cultural resources in Lagos State, a topical analysis. At the Pan African Festival held in Hoya in 1969, Cultural leaders and the showmakers from most of the African countries proclaimed that any African cultural policy should enable the people to acquire knowledge and education in order to assume responsibility for their cultural heritage and development. The recent declaration of Universal Declaration of Cultural Diversity, adopted by General Conference of UNESCO, is also born out of the conviction that culture takes diverse form across time and space as a source of exchange, innovation, and creativity. Cultural diversity is as necessary for human being as both diversity is for nature. In the same vein, the government of Lagos State under the government of Baba Tuni Raji Fashola in its inaugural address promise a government with a clear, compelling purpose to give Lagos a strong cultural identity, to make it one of the 10 mega cities in the world in terms of the urban living indices. The government realized that this goal cannot be fully realized without incorporating cultural heritage into the developmental agenda. Yet, there's no systematic cultural resource database that could guide the formulation and implementation of sustainable policy. The goal of this presentation, therefore, is to start the process of documenting the diversity of cultural resources in Lagos State. And uh, it's also designed particularly to pose a, a technological a analysis of historical and archaeological sites, discuss their significance as well as the educational potential. Let me start by talking about Bivy Lagos State. Lagos State exhibits a variegated culture which puts it in a unique position in Nigeria, being the most economically and commercially important state of the country. Lagos State has been exposed to numerous cultural influences. The admission of its population carry trade from all over the country as well as from the influence introduced through close contact with Europe and the America from the 17th century. So by the, that, by that, by the middle of 19th century, the melting pot characteristics, which now feature in the culture of the present Lagos state, was already evident. This we could also see in the last concluding election when uh, people from the southeast are winning uh, uh, election to the House of Rep. The goal of this presentation, like I said, is to start the process of documenting diversity of cultural resources in Lagos State, which I therefore identify and classify the cultural resources of Lagos State, discuss the importance of and their state of preservation. I will also discuss with appropriate recommendation on the kind of database that will make it possible to better manage these cultural resources. Cultural resources in this context is defined as physical evidence of place of past human activity, site, object, landscape, structure, or natural feature of significance to a group of people traditionally associated with it. Cultural resources can be classified under the archaeological resources, historical structure, cultural landscape, ethnographic resources, and museum objects. The archaeological resources include remain of the past activities and record documenting the scientific analysis of this remain, where the historical structure indicate the material assemblages that extend limit of human capacity. For the purpose of this presentation, a critical site shall be considered to include the following, as defined by the World Heritage Convention article. Work, elements, or structure of archaeological nature. Don't mind me when I'm making of an archaeological 
issues. I'm an archaeologist by training. Element or structure of archaeological nature, group of separate or connected buildings, which because of their architecture, their homogeneity, or their place in the landscape, connected building nature, group of separate connected work of man, or the combined work of nature and work of man, which are of outstanding universal value from the point of view of history, art, or science. Because of time, let's look at why cultural resources. What, what's the importance of cultural resources? Cultural resources is as important, it's an important aspect of our life and our existence. Understanding and appreciation, appreciation of the activities and impact of the past generation will always influence the decision that we make in the present. Put differently, in order to understand the future, we must first understand the common past heritage that we all share. Archaeology also provides a means of verifying and elaborating the past, providing insights into the past way of life and independent verification of past events is often empowered for local community and allow individuals to understand their common heritage. Cultural resources relate only to remains and sites associated with human activities, which include prehistoric and ethno-historic archaeological sites, historic archaeological sites, historic building, element or area of natural landscape, which have traditional cultural significance. The area of traditional cultural significance are area which have been and often continue to be of economic for religious significance to people today. In Lagos State, they include sacred area shrine where religious ceremony are practiced or which are central to their origin as a people. Heritage site or place naturally create connection to our heritage that help us to understand our past, appreciate our triumph, and learn from more about our mistakes. Historical sites also help to preserve our history and record, especially records that are not documented. It's become a platform to trace and reconnect our generation story. Historical sites will help to define and distinguish our community by building a strong sense of identity. Equally important is the ability of the program, this historical site, for tourism purposes, linked with the celebration of an important festival, like for example, in Lagos State, Ebi Repe, Masquerade in Baragri, and other festivals that are observed in Lagos State. That, this activity will ensure the survival of the ethnic nationality, its culture, and cultural resources. This will indirectly guarantee different cultural evidence within the multitude. It can also be considered as a training platform for younger generation as they partake in the cultural activity so as to include, in, so as to inculcate in the youth the essence of our culture. Beside the identity, cultural expression in the form of work of art and craft should be put in the front burner to increase cultural awareness, places of worship, event, and landmark history, and achievement of group and individual should be appreciated as national monument and accorded right recognition. A critical site in Lagos City is considered as a cultural resource, which by its nature is a reflection, attainment, and demonstration of relationship of different cultural entities that occupy Lagos at one time or the other. That is the legacy inherited from the past and passed to the future generation. Well, let, at this point, let me just mention a few of the historical sites and, and maybe discuss, well, maybe, maybe no time, I will just mention then, I go to recommendations so that I can, I will not waste much time. We have places like Ibejuleki, which have relic of European presence. I particularly carry out uh, uh, a archaeological regional survey, survey in this place and also an excavation, you know, during my PhD program. And we could see some of the material that, uh, if well promoted, people that have operated in that site, we want to come and visit, especially the upcoming generation. The Portuguese, the France, we have some relics that indicated that the France and the Portuguese have assisted in that place. These are what some of what can be promoted to encourage people to come. Badagri also, we have the slave through the first building, 
beautiful soil, make it, when you get to this area, you will see a lot of mounds, you know, of fas very fascinating that you know, uh, that people would like to come and see. And Goni, we have a lot of sea beach, and we have a lot of also beach. Akodo also have uh, a landmark of European presence. Freedom Park, like I said, your festival, a big Kayokayo, and the Black Heritage Festival, which is being observed. All these festivals are things that sh we should connect together with historical site so that there could be, uh, people can be encouraged to come and learn about this historical site. Otherwise, all of them are dying, all of them are not, you know, being appropriately preserved and it's giving a problem. I want to give you recommendation. As a state, I'm, I'm, I'm running off for it. <laughs> for us to ensure that our story remain a part of our life today, there will be strong need to form a committee that will promote and enhance visit to our historical site. Lesson that when citizens visit historical sites, they will learn from their story and help to keep their story alive. When maintenance and visit to historical sites are encouraged, so great architectural magnificent landscape and incredible story will be discovered. Part of the step and measure required in the sustainability of the historical site at cultural resources is the establishment of an institution mandated designed to entrench, preserve, and guarantee the survival of our school site for the future. In doing this, our, our cultural identity, cultural expression, and the celebration of our past achievements will be made possible. Lagos is, is a state of many ethnic nationalities with different historical history brought together by advantage of the natural landscape economic and um, commercial potential. The contribution and achievement of this second nationality as scattered across the state, as historical site and monument, which give Lagos its coloration and identity. So I therefore recommend that we need to establish a kind of a state trust to protect historical site, where people can buy into it, and where there could be a well-organized uh, visit to some of these things. Donation to help the state historical site preservation Please, and let me round up by saying that presently, Lagos State is bringing back what we call a community cinema. And this can also work hand in hand to encourage people to come and to understand what is happening in the state. We used to have a Instrument Preservation Committee. It should also be upgraded to a form of national trust, managed and funded by private non-profit organization Money to work to save Lagos historical sites. Two historical sites, we know who we are, what we do, and people will be able to donate and contribute to its growth. And cultural resources management program should also be encouraged. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Oye Chinwa Olikbe, Nancy. And my topic is entitled, The Mass Media and National Development, The Case of Baby Factory Activities in Nigeria. Now, baby factory activities, which is a phenomenon that involves the keeping of teens that can still be termed as children, to be pregnant and meant to bear children for a token, and the children sold to individuals is becoming rampant in Nigeria. There is no legal definition for these activities. And these activities were termed as baby factory activities, baby factory, in quotes, by a Nigerian journalist to describe the criminal activities in the country involving the harboring of girls with unwanted pregnancies against their will, the forced impregnation of helpless young girls and the sale of their babies for illegal adoption to individuals. And it's an issue that is becoming rampant each day because and this issue is also affecting the national development of Nigeria. And it's becoming rampant because of so many factors, which I'm going to um, highlight later on. But my focus is on the role of the media in making sure that this issue is stopped and um, um, is stopped is prevented and combated. 
and to also make sure that this national development of the country keeps on being there, that the growth of the country should keep on being there positively. There are so many issues that are hampering the growth of the country. And some of these issues are child trafficking, human trafficking, and baby fat activities. Now, UNICEF in 2006 were the ones that officially made it um, to be known in Nigeria that there's something like baby factory activities. And when they made their research, conducted their research, they found out that these issues are in so many states in Nigeria. It could be found in a born state, in Abia state, in uh, Lagos state. And they also made us to know that this issue could also be on human rights and should also be termed or should be put under human trafficking and child trafficking because it involves children, teenagers that are not yet adults. And then since 1959, issues on human rights, health matters, immorality, cultural and social stigma, and others related to children's rights have been in focus with the declaration of the rights of the child by the United Nations. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was passed in November 20, 1989, advocates for the right of the child and that the child, by reason of his physical, mental immaturity, needs special safeguards and care, including appropriate legal protection before as well as after birth. But some of the articles talk about the right of the child to freedom of expression, protection of children's privacy, and against attacks on the children's honor and reputation. These issues that came up also said that there is the need for the mass media to disseminate information and material for the benefit of the child and the need for the government to protect children from all forms of exploitation, including baby factory. And because of these issues that came up, the media is seen as one of the um, bodies in Nigeria that could make sure that such issues are combated. Because the issue of baby factory is becoming everyday news affecting the right of the Nigerian child who is supposed to be protected from any form of exploitation and who has the freedom of expression. These teenagers are abused, maltreated, and as they suffer, they suffer denial of basic education, health care, and the rights of a child. Some of them suffer malnutrition and do not enjoy the comfort of a home. And they are also made to suffer the loss of their babies. Because when they give birth to these babies, these babies will be taken away from them and they won't see these babies. They don't know what happens to the babies and what become of their babies. But the mass media has so many functions it plays. And some of these functions, well, we have three main functions, information, education, and entertainment. And the mass media has the role, plays the role of agenda setter and gatekeeper. And that's why the theories for this um, um, study is on agenda setting theory of the mass media and development media theory. And these theories are talking that, saying that the mass media made us individuals, the public, to have issues to think about and form opinions on those issues. And that also that the mass media can be used as a medium to make sure that the development of a country is carried out. And in the course of this research, we, we, I found out that there are some factors that are hindering the mass media in playing their role, these roles highlighted. And though that the mass media actually raised the public opinion on these issues, the mass media created awareness on these issues in Nigeria. They need us to know that, yes, there's something happening, even though that in 2006 that UNESCO talked about it. But the mass media also keep on carrying out daily reports on this issue. But most times, they don't really talk about the issues they talk about. They make it as if it's entertaining. They make us to see it as, OK, it's something that we should watch and listen to. They don't make us to form opinions on it and everybody um, joining hands in combating the issues. And they don't also want to inform the, um, involve the government in making sure that this issue is actually um, put to an end. And some factors were highlighted that could be the issues, why the, the factors that are hindering the mass media in performing their roles in making sure that this issue is combated and 
is put um, 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 that um, there is um, a stop to it. So some of the factors highlighted were economic factors, social factors, and political factors. Then on economic factor, the journalism that is practiced today in Nigeria is market-driven journalism. In the media, the circulation sales and editorial efforts are integrated because they all have one goal, that of marketing news information, which has affected what is being featured by the media artists. The interest of the public is not considered because the media has its are more profit-oriented than watchdog-oriented. Most mass media houses compete with others to get audience and advertisers. The content and programming of mass media houses can be influenced by a market-driven medium. So media corporations are interlocked with financial institutions such that their board of directors serve as journalists and prove a threat to the autonomy of mass media. These journalists might tend to suppress messages which might turn unwanted messages. And the mass media get most of their income from advertisements and sponsoring. And because of this, the media might tend to satisfy the advertisers rather than the audience. And then there is also the political factor. The media function for the societies, but the influence of the government on the media affects government-owned media houses because the government somehow controls the mass media. The news stories and information from the media tends to support the government even when the government is not acting for the interests of the citizens. It therefore becomes the case of he who plays the music, the third, the tune. And then mass media content and programming might be affected because of these controls. And some politicians also that own media houses also control these media houses because um, the owners of the media houses, they have control over the media and influence the programs. And it's not just only the government. These media owners, politicians or whoever they are, they also control what happens because they, they are government-owned media houses and private-owned media houses. I know it's also applicable in, in U.S. And they control what is being you know, dished out to the audience. Hence, they propagate government activities in the media houses, their own activities as well. And they make us not inform opinions on what should be, but their own opinions. Then there are some social factors also. And some of them are poverty, shortage of well-trained journalists, and low level of technological development affect the quality of media content and programming in Nigerian mass media. Poverty and the harsh economic situation in Nigeria have made some journalists to be so vulnerable and as such could easily fall prey to the brown envelope syndrome. The brown envelope syndrome is actually you know, when journalists collect some money from people and what they tend to portray and um, give us, they will not because of what they've collected. That's what we call the brown, um, what we call bribe, the brown envelope syndrome. It affects what is covered in the news and what is made prominent as well. This in turn affects the role of the mass media as agenda setter and as gatekeepers and would make the journalists to be more dependent on the government, on the elite, and the perpetrators of the baby factory activities in Nigeria. Because most times when they go out and they um, research and they, you know, there's what we call investigative journalism, and they've investigated and they found out that there is a home here why baby factory activities um, is being practiced. When they get there, some of them might give them money and say, shut up, shut up, don't talk about it. Don't say that you saw us. Don't talk about what you saw. And because of that, it will hinder them from reporting the news the way it is. In Nigeria today, most graduates of mass communication find themselves in banks and multinational companies to make ends meet. And this affects the quality of media content and programming as well, because anybody who can report news and who can write are in the mass media organizations today. Information may not be properly researched and news gathered may not be adequate. Hence, disturbing issues in Nigeria like baby factory activities will not be covered and featured. And also, there is also the issue of low level of technological development in Nigeria, which is also affecting what is being featured. Now, the role of the mass media as gatekeepers, as agenda setters, as uh, opinion um, formers, as mobilizers and opinion builders could also be met to, to um, help in developing the country and making sure that such issues like baby factory activities are not seen in Nigeria. If all these issues, the factors could be put aside and they play their role as mobilizers in public, supporting the public, 
by writing articles in the print media or broadcasting an item in the broadcast media focusing on baby factory activities, educating the public, and also creating awareness and informing them on, on these issues could help to combat these issues and, um, in Nigeria. Some journalists and mass media organizations may not be adequately aware of the baby factory phenomenon, and as such may not report issues that how they, they may not report it how it is, because they are not actually aware of these issues in Nigeria. And so the mass media, who should also inform, keep on informing, educating, and persuading the ma masses on societal issues, and creating public awareness through campaign, media campaign programs on baby factory issues, to change attitude and behavior of the citizens, protecting the victims, and mobilizing the public to take action, should be made to start doing all these. You know, putting aside those factors and knowing that it's just all about national development, all about making Nigeria to shine in Africa and the world. Now, in conclusion, the media is seen as an agent of change and development. Hence. The development of a nation is assured when the media are utilized for societal and human enlightenment through sourcing and dissemination of information and educating the masses. The issue of baby factory is becoming everyday news affecting the right of the Nigerian child who is supposed to be protected from any form of exploitation and who has the right, the freedom of expression. These teenagers are abused and maltreated. And because of this, the Nigerian mass media as an agent of national development has constitutional rights to freedom of expression and therefore should be expected to educate the public, create public awareness, and mobilize public support on societal issues. They are to continue to play their role as agenda setters, gatekeepers, and watchdog, contributing to democratic governance and accountability of, a Niger of Nigeria, thereby aiming at developing the nation. Recommendation. The professionalism of journalists and editors are supposed to constrain the power of owners. Journalists are therefore expected to be fierce in their pursuit of the truth and are not supposed to be biased regularly in favor of one particular perspective. And therefore, the investigative journalist should keep on uncovering the happenings in the society. They are expected to dig deeper and bring out disturbing issues in the society I report these issues frequently to be able to create awareness and raise public opinions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our last book is actually on the program. Uh, Melissa Kelly is going to move us from Nigeria to South Africa. I said the last poll. You're just reading an aspect. Who couldn't make the trip due to visa issues. Her name is Falana Miri Yemisi. And the title of her paper is Survey of Quality and Living Standards Among Urban and Rural Families in Undo State, Nigeria. Um, considering the International Organization of Consumers Union's positions as spelled out in the Geneva Convention of 1985, there are four basic needs for survival which every human being should have access to. They include access to quality food, access to adequate and functional clothing, access to comfortable shelter and health care facilities. So on the basis of this basic need, I think she decided to carry out a survey to see how well urban dwellers slash rural dwellers in southwestern Nigeria using the perspectives of people from Ondo State are faring in these four areas. And see uh, the environmental hindrances that could be affecting their ability to access these four basic needs as well as discuss the outcomes and provide some solutions on how we could improve the standards of living. The researcher used a four Likert scale questionnaire, having very good, scored four points, good, three points, fair, two points, and poor, one point. And this Likert scale questionnaire was administered on 135 urban dwellers, as well as 135 rural dwellers in Undo State. 
The samples were chosen using the propulsive sampling technique. Uh, both of uh, urban and rural dwellers used were men, women, literate and non-literate. I think she interpreted the items on the questionnaire in the local language for those who were not li uh, literate, and literate uh, samples did the scoring themselves. The data collected were treated using descriptive statistics, and the results showed that 75% of rural dwellers did not enjoy quality food, despite the fact that most of them lived in the local areas. The best of the harvest on a yearly basis were taken to the market to sell. Even as low as games, small ones that they killed were sold to make money. And that one resulted in poor quality feeding and the resultant effect of poor health uh, as well as poor housing conditions. 68% of the rural dwellers didn't have access to portable water supply. 80% lived in homes where basic amenities of electricity were elusive. And for the urban dwellers, they experienced breakdown of law and order. A lot of the social vices were found in high presence in urban areas. There was also the problem of overcrowding due to unaffordable costs of rentage of houses. These issues were discussed, and the study concluded that poverty is the bane of the poor quality food, inadequate clothing, which has led to indecent dressing, particularly among our youth, and an erosion on our cultural values, and that to get ourselves out of the mess, the researcher recommended that government non-governmental organizations and good-spirited individuals need to form a synergy where regular and portable water supply, stable power supply, good road networks, security, and health services are made available to our people. And that if we are able to do this, it will be possible to close the gap and we can say we eat good, and we can say food becomes you, we can say you will be addressed well if you dress well. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so back to the program. Brown paper, moving us to Thank South you. Africa briefly, and then we'll bring it off the Any questions? Okay. Can everybody see the slides here? Yeah? yeah? And hopefully you can hear me. Yes, good. All right, so in that case, there's just one more problem, and that is that the question mark is missing in the program. So I hesitated a little bit earlier when I read my title and realized that it sounded a little bit different in the program than it does here. So the title of my presentation is actually Informal Citizens, Residences, Perceptions of Space and Place in a South African Informal Settlement. I'm Melissa Kelly, but I would also like to acknowledge the contributions of my supervisor, Jan K. Kotze, and my master's student, Letse Holecieno, who couldn't join me today, but who have nevertheless had a great deal of input into this presentation. So in South Africa, there are many informal settlements. For those of you who aren't familiar with this term, it basically refers to communities of makeshift shacks. So Houses essentially made out of recycled materials, like uh, corrugated iron, sometimes even just scrap pieces of plastic or even cardboard. Um, although these settlements can be found throughout the so-called developing world, the situation in, Africa is, in South Africa is a little bit specific given the legacy of apartheid. So under the apartheid government, black mobility was very restricted and it was very difficult for black people to enter urban areas in South African cities. But at the end of apartheid, these restrictions were lifted. And at this time, there was a great deal of migration into urban areas, creating a large number of informal settlements um, surrounding urban areas. 
This was mostly a result of housing shortages at the time. And although apartheid ended in 1994, and the government has been trying to deal with the issue, there are still many people without adequate housing. Uh, so since about 2004, the government has been very committed to upgrading informal settlements, that is basically replacing these settlements with houses, proper houses, but it's taking a great deal of time. So in the meantime, people are just basically waiting um, to be given a house and a piece of land. So there are an estimated 1.2 million households still living in informal settlements in South Africa. The people that are entitled to receive housing subsidies in, in South Africa are South African citizens. So in South Africa, there are a number of migrants from neighboring countries like Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. These people, unless they are naturalized, will not be entitled to upgrading. So there's already a strong link between citizenship and the right to housing in South Africa. So generally speaking, South African citizens feel that this is a right. They have been promised that they will be given a house. Uh, so much of the literature on informal settlements in South Africa emphasizes how um, those people who have not been given the right to housing but yet stay in an informal situation could be considered political insurgents. So they're fighting for the right uh, to live where they want to and to secure eventually their right to a house. Um, alternatively, some of the literature has emphasized um, and kind of romanticized what goes on in these settlements emphasizing how people actually feel very at home in them, they develop a sense of community, and therefore they shouldn't be forced, for example, to move to a different place. Um, so thereby kind of legitimating these settlements in a sense. So from what I've observed, there are a couple of grand narratives in the literature that emphasizes that citizenship is either occurring um, more at the national level with people fighting for their national rights or alternatively more at a localized level where people are enacting citizenship from below by creating kind of an alternative form of citizenship within these settlements. But what I wanted to find out was how informal settlement dwellers themselves relate to space and place and what um, the relationship is between legal rights and citizenship. So in other words, I wanted to consider the scale in which citizenship is enacted from the individual's perspective rather than the community perspective. So the theory that I'm drawing on is very much located within the field of geography and citizenship studies. It, while recognizing the importance of legal citizenship, also goes beyond it to view this concept as shifting, contextual, and also multiscalar. And I'm focusing, as I said, very much on the individual level. So I'm looking at the agency that individuals have to enact citizenship, which, as I said, is very much overlooked in the current literature. So the focus is on the everyday realities of these individuals. This study focuses on one specific site, which is called Kailicha. It hasn't been given very much attention at all uh, in the media or in academic discussions, probably due to the lack of political activity in this region. Nobody's really stood up and protested about the lack of houses there. Um, so it's a very quiet settlement, although it's very large. Since 2007, about 50,000 people have moved to this area. And by the way, it's located just outside Bloemfontein, which is a medium-sized city right in the middle of South Africa. Um, there's no public transport or anything connecting this settlement to the city, um, and it is 15 kilometers away. So that kind of gives you a sense of the way in which the settlement is both kind of part of Bloemfontein, it's integrated. Many people walk that 15 kilometers in order to access stores, for example, or to go to work. Um, but at the same time, obviously, it's not very convenient for the people living there. It's just far enough to be, to create some difficulties for them. This land is not considered desirable, which in the South African context means that it's likely to be upgraded. So in other words, nobody else really wants this land. So the people that are settled there can probably stay there. So the way they see it, it's just a matter of waiting for the time when the government will come and tell them, all right, everybody gets their own piece of land, everybody gets a house. But in the meantime, they're living without any electricity, any basic services. They don't have access to a water supply, toilets, 
or um, anything else. So let's say Jole Tieno did um, narrative interviews with the individual residents in this area. Um, he's multilingual, so he carried out these interviews in English, Sutu, and Teswana. Quite an amazing feat. Um, he also conducted ethnographic uh, work as well, so he made several visits to the site, kind of got to know what was going on in the community, and that's also how he was able to make contacts and eventually conduct these interviews. Then we used a thematic analysis to identify key themes that uh, were raised by the participants. So this is still a work in progress, but I'll just share with you our preliminary findings. The first is that the participants didn't really concern themselves with this dominant human rights discourse that is so often discussed in the literature on informal settlements in South Africa. They were much more concerned with their day-to-day -day realities. So they actively chose not to protest, not to make too many demands of the government, and they just decided to sit in their uh, specific plot of land they had already demarcated specific plots for each of the residents there, hoping that the government would see that they're there, that they need this land, and that eventually um, they would get formalized. So that was sort of the first finding, the lack of um, political engagement. However, this does not mean that these people are not, in a sense, enacting citizenship, because they were, in their passive way, very uh, keen to establish a normal life in the settlement, so-called normal, which for them meant that they wanted to maintain a sense of dignity, they wanted to feel that they were accepted by the larger Bloemfontein society. And often they did this by taking meticulous care of their homes, arranging them in such a way that they resembled formalized houses. They would, for example, although they had only one room, they would divide it with drapes, um, take care to decorate it with whatever small possessions they had, and so on. They, there are also a number of social rules in, in the settlement that kind of help to maintain order, with men, for example, having certain roles, women having certain roles. And these were very important in terms of uh, feeling that they belong to society. But one of our interesting findings was also that the participants were not only trying to belong to the settlement or even to the wider Bloemfontein, but also to other parts of South Africa um, and other communities, because this was a very diverse community of people that came together essentially just to meet their basic living needs. They came from a variety of backgrounds. Um, many of the residents weren't South African citizens at all, which, as I said earlier, would imply that they will never have a chance at formalization. Um, but up, even among the South African citizens, they came from different ethnic groups, different linguistic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, and so on. So while they were trying to maintain a sense of belonging to the settlement, they were also concerned with their other identities. So I've shared a quote here, for example, from one man who saw himself as a very traditional Sutu man. And for him, having land was very important because he needed it to conduct his ancestor worship activities, for example. This wasn't a concern to everybody, but for him, it was important for maintaining a, a sense of belonging to uh, the wider Sutu community in particular. A third finding is that although the residents were very diverse in the settlement, they did come together to meet their daily, essentially, survival needs. So this meant se uh, securing safety, within the community, for example, by devising a whistle-blowing system. So everyone was given a whistle that they could blow, and if they ever felt like they were in trouble, they could blow that whistle, and the community would come to their aid. It also meant assisting with uh, babysitting, the sharing of food, these sorts of things, just to keep some sense of order in the community and to help one another, uh, one another out. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the literature often kind of romanticizes these communities and implies that people are very happy in this kind of arrangement. Our findings would suggest that this wasn't necessarily the case and that this form of citizenship from below, so to speak, was very fragile and very temporal. And for the most part, people didn't trust each other all that much. They were happy that they could be given whatever support was available, but essentially they didn't see this as a long-term solution. 
Um, instead, they were more anxious to get their own house, their own space, and to get doors, for example, that would properly lock, rather than having to rely on a whistleblowing system. So in fact, most of the participants said they would be very happy to be moved somewhere else if they could be given land and house. And it didn't bother them that much if they would be, for example, separated from their neighbors. So I'll just end with some preliminary conclusions. Indeed, the state does influence citizenship at different levels of scale. So obviously, the legal dimension here is important. If you're a South African citizen, for example, you are entitled to land. So that is very important. And it definitely affects the possibilities for inclusion and exclusion. But beyond that, what truly mattered to our participants was improving their material living conditions, their day-to-day -day realities, and also, on a more emotive level, um, securing a position for themselves in the wider society. So developing a sense of self-worth self and belonging in their daily lives. So I would say that the findings from our study are different from many of the other findings on informality in the South African context, insofar as we go beyond this fear of eviction discourse, which is uh, probably um, particularly discussed in the South African literature because of the apartheid legacy. Furthermore, I just want to emphasize that the societies to which the residents desired full acceptance to were at, indeed at different levels of scale. And I think it is important to discuss that. So it's not just about belonging to the settlement or to uh, the towns where these settlements are located outside, but the participants within these settlements also have other belonging needs that go right from the level of the nation down to the level of the community and everything in between. So the participants' attachments to place, in other words, transcended the specific settlement and were at other levels of scale as well. Finally, by adopting a narrative approach, as we have done, our study has tried to go beyond these narrow conceptions of citizenship, so commonly emphasized in the literature, and we have instead explored the various places and spaces that affect people's identities and sense of belonging simultaneously, very much from an individual perspective. So by adopting this phenomenological approach, approach that emphasizes the significance of individual life trajectories, it would seem that a number of the dominant discourses in the South African literature, at least, on informal settlement dwellers uh, should be called into question. Thank you very much. presentations and as you have pointed out rightly the role of media as an agent of change and development do you do we have any other things that the government can do when all effort has been tried but nobody is punished nothing is it or do we just be studying it like this we have an experience of soca in Nevada in New York State Eventually, everything just died off like that. Nothing, nothing. So what else do you think the media can do so that the government will support or the power to be? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the issue of baby factory, uh, I think it's a very good yeah, let me thank all the presenters for their contributions. On this issue of baby factory, 
I think the issue of the media, there's a need for you to have a look at it again. Because the issue of corruption is an issue that is creating problem in African uh, countries, and Nigeria in particular. And you rightly pointed out that some of these people, uh, people who are in the media, uh, being influenced. So what do you think the government and the public should do? Now, on my brother, who present... Actually, um, he has really mentioned what I wanted to. He has mentioned what I wanted to. But in addition to that, I do expect you to write in your recommendation what can be done to the journalist. Having in mind that the journalist in Nigeria are poorly paid. So I don't really see anything wrong in them. You know, if they were able to receive a giant um, brown envelope from individuals and the government are unable to pay them what they are supposed to earn. So the level of commitment to the government will be very low. Secondly, I also want to mention, because you made a mention that all governments in Nigeria are, are, are aware of the baby factory issues, but they do pretend you know, not to know anything about it. Maybe it's not um, part of their political issues, the agenda in their political issues. So what do you think we can do concerning that? Because it has become a global issue now. Thank you. So, um, even though, even though all of the, the three questions have been. Uh, um, personally, I want to throw some more light into the baby factory thing. I think that the information we got back home concerning the baby factory and other ritual killings that were so rampant, even still rampant now, is that most of the politicians, the big wigs amongst them, actually patronize these regional killers to get some fetish preparations that make them to be popular or make them to get more, uh, get richer by the day and so on. So could this be a reason, could this be a reason government has not taken any decisive reaction on the perpetrators? That is for the presenter. Thank you. So do, do you want to comment on any of the issues that have been On baby raised? fashion? No, no, I don't no, no but even in response. So, yes. We don't have any. Yes. Um, I'd like to comment the presenter. I still want to appreciate the fact that uh, the baby fashion is still being raised. I still want to appreciate the fact that she need not to generalize. Because when you look at the role of the media currently in the country, there's a lot of improvement. And not all of them, uh, I mean, I can talk about channels, even when you look at what happened in this uh, last election, you could, you could realize that in, in every sector, not even the media alone, like you said, there's corruption. And it affects most of the our impact in every issue that you wanted to raise at any point in time. And that's also not to say that journalists in Nigeria have not tried you know, to improve and to make things work out. So I want to say that in the final presentation of, his, of, of your paper, we should try as much as possible to look at uh, 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 not actually generalizing on the role of the media as if they were all corrupt. Thank you. Okay. Actually, do, do we have a perspective from South Africa on what's going on in Nigeria? Okay. Okay. So let's take another round of questions. Okay. Okay. One, okay, two, three. You want to stand up and introduce? Um, my question is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my question is um, directed to you and um, to the South African lady. 
Now, regarding the baby factory, uh, I think you should also interrogate the victim troop. Can you hear me? Okay, the, the victimization troop that's ongoing. And uh, what about the girls themselves? You, you know, you said something about the girls adopting, you know, this uh, identification from the West, right? Like the childhood thing is all labor-free, and it's not right in Africa. It's not, it's not rooted in the African reality. Now, given that, and if you draw from that, what about the, the girls? How do they play in this? Could it be that some of them are not necessarily victims? Could it be that some of them want to give out the babies, and this is just a site for them to be able to do that? So, I mean, and earn some money. So it's not all a question of their being victims. You know, it's, it's necessary to problematize that a bit. I mean, that's, that's what I think. And then, you know, the South African, you talked about informal settlements. And I'm wondering, the methodology that you used uh, in terms of narrative and uh, with regards to individual contestations, is, is that enough? to be able to actually get the entire picture, the wholesome picture. I, I'm just uh, a little bit interested in that. So you could throw more light on it. Yeah. OK, that, that's my question. Yeah. Beginning to uh, kind of create a, a, a culture of feminism around their sexuality and take power and money and, and, their, and their sex and attractiveness and everything about it. Um, kind of into their own hands and make their own business and their own image out of it, as opposed to being um, subjugated to that image by, by men. Um, and so I'm wondering if that trend is occurring in Nigeria, or if you think it will occur, and what reaction you have to that. OK, sorry. Uh, my question is to the lady who made the presentation on the growth of the informal sector or settlement in South Africa. Now, I am wondering, since the transition from apathy to uh, a new system of government, has the rate of growth in the in informal settlement thing, has it reduced? And then what policies has the government made in terms of land, provision of land for acquisition of housing? That's just what I want to ask. That stood out to me was this idea of cultural production and mass media and this interaction between local and global um, spheres. And I'm wondering how um, uh, you conceptualize, um, and this is for everybody, um, sort of Lagos' uh, space in terms of global cultural production across the African continent and across the African diaspora and sort of the implications of hip hop as well as the journalism, the coverage of uh, baby factories. And to maybe uh, bring uh, uh, Ms. Kelly's uh, presentation into the conversation too, it's like how do sort of national or global ideas of home sort of shape uh, informal um, settlers view of, of their place and, and sort of vice versa, perhaps how are images of informal settlements um, being projected outwards globally um, things um, I definitely hear what you're saying um, I'm actually part of a narrative research group so we are committed to doing narrative research and we use narrative methodology to look at a range of topics so I would agree that this is perhaps a weakness when it comes to contributing for example to the literature on a topic like informal settlements. In fact, I would go as far as saying that's not really my area of expertise. I'm more theoretical, I'm more interested in contributing to the literature on citizenship in the city, for example. But it would be great in the future maybe to team up with people that have that kind of expertise to kind of take our research further and make it more policy relevant. So I think that also speaks to the second question that I was asked, because again, I'm not really an expert on policy unless it concerns the actual individuals that I'm studying. I know that things are getting better little by little. There's, it's, things are moving slower than expected, but 
the government is making an effort to build houses as quickly as possible and to make sure that the land is available for that. And I do think that compared to a decade ago, things are looking up a bit now. So that's all I can really say about that. Um, concerning the last question about national and global views on home and settlements, I think this is a great question. I have written other papers on the topic of home specifically and what it means to the people under study. Um, I don't want to get too much into that now, but I definitely think there is a link between um, national and global perceptions of home and what is actually going on in these settlements. So I'll just leave it there. Can I just say that the right to housing is not only a universal human right, but it's also a constitutional right in South Africa. And South Africa's constitutional court has heard a number of cases regarding South Africa's, or the South, the South African government's ability to or willingness to provide adequate housing, and it's rather um, less than admirable record. So you're being, but anyway, that this is. Yes. Sorry, I didn't <laughs> interrupt there. Okay. Thank you for all the questions. Um, they are basically based on what the government can do to make sure that these activities are curtailed and combated. And um, now the issue of um, the girls themselves, when you target them, what are their roles too? You see, when um, there are a lot of causes of baby factor activities in Nigeria, and one of them is poverty. Now the next one is illiteracy. I during um, 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 when I was researching on this because it's also what I'm doing for my postgraduate um, program. Some of these girls they are illiterate, they don't go to school, they are street hawkers, and most of them don't even have money. Their parents are poor, and. There is also what we call um, societal influence and cultural influence in, in Africa. Now, in Africa, when a girl child gets pregnant, it's like a taboo. And the girl child wouldn't want anybody to know that she's pregnant. So she can easily go to these homes on her own and not being lured. She will get there. She will, um, after nine months, she will give birth to this baby and she will get out of that place with nobody knowing about what happened. So it's one of the issues and causes of, of, of these um, homes being there in Nigeria. Now, if the issue of poverty is the main thing that causes baby factory activities, then the government should be the first set of um, bodies that should work on making sure that baby factory activities in Africa in the world, because it's becoming a global issue, is in the United um, kingdom is in USA here is in America but a lot of people call it so many things they can call it baby harvesting some call it baby factory some a lot of names for it where this happened people give away their keys most times they give them away voluntarily but most times they give them away involuntarily the government can come in making sure that poverty is eradicated we have what is called the Millennium Goal. And unfortunately, unfortunately, most times I used to say, now I don't want to be, I don't want to be in the academic world now. I want to be just myself. Most times I used to say that till Christ comes for those that are Christians. I don't think this will happen in Africa. <laughs> I just said till Christ comes, you know. The issue of there is always going to be the issue of the rich and the poor. And I always back it up with the Bible, and I say even in the Bible, there is also, there was the issue of the rich and the poor. Read your Bible. Read your Bible very well. There was the issue of the rich and the poor in the Bible. And then, but we can't because there is also the issue, there, we, can't be, we can't say, okay, there is poverty, that will always be the poor. When you create awareness of this thing shouldn't be, this thing is not supposed to be. Even if someone doesn't have money, the government can also come in and say, this is an issue that shouldn't be. And then support the media and make sure that this issue is not there. And so for me, 
the government has a big role to play to make sure that the issue of trafficking, because we have now put it under human trafficking and child trafficking, that the issue of trafficking, which the main cause of trafficking is poverty. So if poverty is somehow removed and reduced, it's not going to be removed. If it's reduced, then these issues will not be the way it is. Thank you. Do you, do you, do you want to speak to any of the questions? That we... Okay, well, in answering the question concerning uh, the, the hip hop as a means for empowerment, just like Beyonce and uh, Nicki Minaj. Well, we, we have very few hip hop artists, female artists, that have actually broken even in Nigeria as against the male counterparts. So uh, we, for now, we don't find some of them going into other areas of businesses that we do know of, like Beyonce. Uh, the only thing they really look up to is how to project their music. But we have the male counterparts really getting into, you know, having other chains of businesses uh, because they are really much more in the limelight than the female counterpart. So I don't know if I've answered that, that, that question. Okay. And uh, relating to the aspect of the global space and the perception of the people, uh, the, the hip hop music, I mean, the perception of hip hop musicians in both national and international space. I, I think in Nigeria, we have our own variant of hip hop which we call the Niger hip hop. And what the Nigerians are doing is trying to build their brand of Niger hip hop to relate to the identity of the Nigerian. So we find a situation where the Niger hip hop has a confluence of both the you know, uh, Western hip hop and the local content. So that's what they are trying to do. But of course, when we talk about the situation that is that I am talking about now, uh, the issue of you know, the use of women, uh, we find that very, very prominent in the Nigerian sense. Where when you look at our videos and you look at the videos of the hip hop musicians from America, in terms of the dressing and in terms of you know the makeup and all, you won't find much difference. So what some of the musicians are doing, actually, uh, is trying to brand the hip hop to uh, portray our cultural values. We find some of them now trying to use our own female costumes and then situate the, 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 the music within the terrain of the African setting instead of going to South Africa to shoot the videos or going by the seashore with bikinis, uh, you know, to shoot the videos. You now see them by the, you know, uh, uh, area. You see them in, 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 in villages or, you know, local town setting where uh, such videos are now being shot. So that at least people will know that this thing is not a foreign thing. It's a Nigerian thing. But of course, the perception deals with the ability of us to break even in the international media, I mean, the international sphere. How many hip hop musicians actually have broken even globally in Nigeria? I haven't seen of any that has really broken. What I mean by that is winning the Grammy Awards, for example. I mean, in, the only person that actually boosted of it has faded out. Nice said, don't doubt me, I'll get you Grammy. And he hasn't give, gotten us one yet. <laughs> but the fact we are trying to say is that they are popular within the local sphere. And the people are getting to uh, understand Niger hip hop music, which is fast rising. And then the, the international Western hip hop music coming fast dwindling. But of course, the content in terms of the, the, the dressing still remains the same. 
You want to say a few words? No, I'm okay. Okay. Well, we have gone.